All righty. Welcome one. Welcome all. Oh, it's nice to Can see. Can they not get in there? A big gang of see you. in here. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and mute everybody at the moment while we're getting started here and everybody's getting connected. Thank you very much for joining the Wyatt's Gift Zoom workshop. And I believe Wyatt's going to be joining us here directly and hope everybody's having a good weekend looking forward to exploring uh, some of the things that I know that have brought a lot of joy to Wyatt and myself and so the plan is for us to um, there we get some more people in here is to talk about uh, three subjects primarily and we're gonna kinda of go into depth into each of those uh, the first is gonna be uh, practice organization and uh, people are, you know there are a lot of different ways up the mountain so to speak and one size doesn't necessarily fit all but what I have done with folks that I've been working with over the past couple three years is recommend uh, you know if you're not feeling like you're getting a good steady trajectory with your growth uh, a three pillared practice system that I would encourage all of y'all to feel into and try for you know a week or two and see if you're starting to see some more gains and we'll talk about that and we'll talk about counting a little bit um, because in my experience, there are folks that, um, you know, kind of have a, a gift for hearing music, hearing phrasing, all that kind of stuff, being able to, you know, coordinate the, the foot tapping, all that kind of stuff. And other folks have to work at it. Everybody's got their, their strengths and, and weaknesses. Some people might be able to play, you know, arrangements flawlessly and not be able to like come up with their own stuff. Some people might be able to come up with their own stuff, but can't play, you know, <clears throat> note for note path, things like that. Uh, so what I have found is that learning to count a little bit or a lot of it uh, can really be helpful with folks that are, are struggling with being able to hear phrasing because a lot of uh, a lot of times people will like leave beats out at the end of phrases or add beats here and there, uh, which can be really frustrating, obviously. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get into the Monroe style improvising. We're going to work with three main uh, what I call devices or modular devices. Here comes Mr. Wyatt, the star of the show. I believe he's on his way to Nashville to finish working on his forthcoming debut album that Justin Moses is producing. And he's got a, a slew of all-stars that he has written tunes with. We'll get him in here. How you doing, Wyatt? Good. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. Welcome to the Wyatt's Gift Workshop. <laughs> wow. I think it's just a beautiful thing. So uh, many of y'all probably know that uh, on the Monroe uh, Mandolin Appreciation Society Facebook group, we have an annual contest for writing a tune in Monroe style. And uh, the way that I came to know Wyatt was his first entry that he wrote with uh, his first main teacher, Roscoe Morgan, who is uh, who came actually came up, came up with the idea for the Monroe Mandolin Appreciation Society. Many long years ago, it was nine years ago, back in 2013, and he and Wyatt wrote a, a tune. What was that tune called? Was it Bluegrass Part 2? Yeah, it was called Bluegrass Part 2. Yeah, and so that was kind of a play on Bluegrass Part 1, which is an old Bluegrass uh, Bill Monroe instrumental. And uh, that won the contest uh, that first year, and then Wyatt won last year, and then he won again this year. Uh, no, no post on the Monroe Appreciation Society had gotten more than, uh, I think about 250 likes. And, and the way that the, the contest works is that, you know, you post your video and then a like is a vote for the contest. And so Wyatt's, uh, Wyatt's tune 
I think now has about se over 700 votes on it. It's a great tune. It's called The, the Winds of Rowan County. And, uh, and so he won the contest and then donated uh, his uh, prize money. Uh, and that has, you know, made way for this, this workshop, which I'm so grateful that all of y'all have joined us here. It's a nice, good crowd here. And so I want to turn it over to Wyatt a little bit. You know, Wyatt's a, a very remarkable uh, young man, as y'all probably already know. I don't think there's anybody who has ever learned as much Monroe-style music uh, at such an early age. And uh, so I want to turn it over to Wyatt for him to talk about his journey with the mandolin. So take it away, Mr. Ellis. Yeah. So like like you said, you know, um, I well, yeah, I started... Um, you know, learning some fiddle tunes, you know, like some some simple fiddle tunes off a little bit of tab, taking some lessons once a week. And then I did the um, the, Mon the Monroe, the first Monroe contest. And that's how I came to know Chris. And I started going to the um, the Monroe mandolin workshops with him and David McLaughlin. And that got me um, learning by ear, which just totally opened up my improvising and um, the, the, the speed of learning, you know, like everything just became so much easier. And, you know, I could hear the, um, the feel of the music and not just the notes off of a sheet of paper, which is, you know, which is a big deal. Yeah. And so uh, I think we can, we can look at, at Wyatt and his uh, process, uh, his journey with learning mandolin. Uh, for ins inspiration and also, uh, you know, instructive wisdom with regard to how it can work. So uh, I think, you know, there might be one notable exception to uh, the, the masters of Monroe style all learning by ear. Um, I think that pretty much everybody, everybody did, you know, we're thinking about Bill Monroe himself and Frank Wakefield and, uh, you know, the other... Uh, main uh, acolytes, you might say, like uh, my dad, Red Henry, David McLaughlin, Mike Compton, Ronnie McCurry. I believe Andy Statman uh, might be the, the exception there that uh, transcribed on paper a lot of uh, Monroe solos. But uh, by and large, uh, we believe, and as Bill Monroe said, it was the best way to uh, learn how to, to do the music, learning it by ear. And so, why? Why don't you talk about you know uh, some of your early challenges with uh, getting your flow going that you might think that that you know it would be normal for uh, a student to encounter? Yeah, you know, like one of the big challenges for me, like really, really early on, was uh, timing. And you know, I think it just keeps getting better and better as I as I play with more people and as I I learn by ear more and more. And, um, you know, like timing may be the most important part of playing, you know, and Bill's timing was so, so really, really, really unique and versus like um, some of the other players, you know, and like just getting that aspect of his playing mastered is, is a really big deal and just like timing in general. Yeah. So timing can be a big subject. Can yeah. you, can you, uh, can you dive in a little bit more to what you mean when you're talking about timing? Are you talking about, um, you know, how you relate to the center of the beat? Are you talking about phrasing? Are you talking about note spacing? You're talking about all those things? No. Yeah, all those things, really. You know, like um, when, I, when I started learning, you know, I, I learned all online, you know, because everything was shut down and um, and that and not getting to play with people, you know, and like my... Uh, you know, I would really push the beat sometimes and and stuff like that. Um, and that uh, presented a problem, you know, in jam sessions. And that's just something that, that comes as you play more and more. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody kind of relates to that sensibility of timing in, in different ways. You know, in bluegrass, there can be um, advocacy towards uh, learning to play with drive, which can be a great thing. And that can also be taken to yeah, like it's not it's not like a really bad thing sometimes to push the beat in Monroe style. You just don't want to push it too much. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I know that you've worked uh, extensively with a metronome and with Strum Machine, 
For anybody that doesn't know about Strum Machine, it's a bit of a revolutionary game changer for the modern world of, of practicing. And, you know, there, there are so many uh, technological advantages that our modern world has over, uh, you know, previous generations that had to learn right off the records because if you're going to slow the records down in the old days, you know, it would drop, it, drop the, the pitch by an octave. And so that made uh, being able to hear things much more challenging. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we have uh, as we're heading towards this concept of talking about uh, practice organization, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, grunt work. So grunt work is what we call, you know, eating your, your, your mandolin vegetables. And uh, some of y'all may love the vegetables, but uh, for me, uh, I didn't run scales and practice exercises really at all until I was about 25. So I've been playing the man almost 15 years before I, I started to do all that stuff. And quickly, over a summer in which I assiduously and religiously devoted myself towards building speed with the folded scale, I found that at the end of that, that period of time, uh, I could really play a lot more comfortably, cleanly, and not that speed is the point of everything, but if you can play really fast, it sure makes uh, going slowly and mediumly uh, a lot easier. Uh, and so, yeah. yeah, so let's let's just kind of jump into this idea of uh, organizing one's practice. So why I want you to talk a little bit about what you feel like works the best for you in terms of developing a solid trajectory where you're always seeing good measured growth and gains. You know, that's something I, I'm still working on, you know, and, you know, getting like a really solid routine. But, you know, like the folded scale and I started on that and, you know, it took me a while to get that down. And, oh, and so let's, let's pause there and let's let's break that down for folks that, that are unfamiliar with the folded scale. What is the folded scale? Why is it called the folded scale? And why is it good? Um, so, you know, have you so, got your original sound on, buddy? Oh, yeah. My original sound. Maybe you don't want it on because I just put new strings on and <laughs> just staying in tune at all. Okay, so now it's so now it's good. But... What mandolin you got there today? This is my uh, 2020 uh, Gibson Master Model, David Harvey signed. Nice. I really like playing this one. Um, overall, it's a great man. I like it a lot. Um, so the folded scale um, is like, um, so your regular scale. That's G major, two octave, That's regular the scale. Regular, yeah, two octave, straight up and down, uh, G major scale. And then your so folded. You gotta start there. If you don't know that, you gotta know that, right? Yeah. Then your regular folded scale. Um, there's there's two variations. Like I think one we call like the, the skipper pattern, and the other one is like is the regular folded pattern. And so your folded pattern, it goes so it starts off with the open two four open. So it's like it repeats three. Um, back three notes you know okay so stop there so 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 it, it, go, it goes up three notes and then it goes back to the note you started on started on and it starts on the second note goes second. up three notes and comes back to the note you started on is that right yeah so it's like one two three then back to the one Now, what did you do at the end there? I did a, um, a, a two octave G major arpeggio. Okay. So for those, for those that don't know what an arpeggio is, what is an arpeggio? The, um, 
So it's the one, three, and five of um, your your major chord, which is uh, in this case it would be G B D G B D G. And so when you're talking those numbers, do you mean frets or what does that mean? Oh, so it's the um, it's the scale degree. So if you go up the scale. Um, your G note in the G major scale is your one, then you've got your two, which is your A, then your three, which is your B. So your three is, so you've got your one, your three, then three, four, five, the fifth note of the G major scale. So. And then what happens, what happens after you do your, 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 uh, your third note? Does it, does it, does it start over? Um, actually, uh, nope, it just goes straight up. All right, so you got your one, your three, your five, and your one. I think you're a little low. On, yeah, on I'm a little flat. I mean, actually, yeah, one, two, one, two, two, my two. tuner's in like 432 again. Why don't you tune up and I'll, I'll, I'll talk yeah. for just a second. Okay. All right, so... Yeah, so the folded scale it kind of goes in a in a little spiral. It's like da 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 da, and it can be a good thing, you know, right off the bat, you know, to start humming along to this, you know, at a at a certain point too. Of course, that'll be easier, uh, maybe for the men to to hum that low G note, but you can also for the ladies that have you know higher pitched voices, you can. You can start on the top octave, so you can be playing this note, and you can be singing this note. So there's your G, and here's your low G, but you can start singing there. So da 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 is the same way you start. So, well, it's backwards. So you go up your first three notes. One, two, three, one. So when you're coming down, you come down the same way. One, two, three, one. So you can do it, you can, people kind of orient to it different ways. Some people want to go da, 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 and play four notes, but just play three notes is what I recommend. One, two, three, one. So that's the three, two, open, three, coming down. Da, 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 da. So on and so forth. When we get to the bottom, you can play your arpeggio. All right, so that's the open G, fourth fret of the G, open D, fifth fret of the D, second fret of the A, fifth fret of the A, and third fret of the E. When you get there, you can either come down or you can use your your little finger to get the major third extension, which is the seventh fret of the E, and come back down. Good things that this helps you practice is switching strings on the upstroke. So when you hit that open D, it's going to be a downstroke. You come back to the fourth fret of the G on an upstroke. That's one of the hardest things to do cleanly on the mandolin. There's another upstroke on the string above. Same thing twice, so on and so forth. So you do that in G, you do that in A. You know, same thing, just starting on the 2nd fret. All the way to the 5th fret of the E, back down the same way, 3 notes, back to the top note. Fast forward. When you get to the bottom, play your arpeggio. Alright, so you got G and you got A, and then if you really want to try something challenging, you go to G sharp. And so forth all the way up tag it with an arpeggio let's talk about closed uh, arpeggio just just for a second because you can play like if you're an a you can play your arpeggio with the open strings which is good to learn how to do to me i think it's more advantageous for bluegrass and this kind of you know idea about heading towards you know monroe style to be practicing the, the the two octave arpeggio in the closed position so you play your first three notes 
okay? Two, six, two, and then you hop into your three finger chord position for A. All right, seventh fret of the D is your regular A, a chop chord, or three fingers. First fret of the, uh, fourth fret of the A, excuse me, and fifth fret of the E. You play your upper octave arpeggio out of that chord position. So you get your first three notes, hop into your chord position, play the extension or not. Okay, so right there you have you know, three very valuable exercises that you can use for your grunt work, which is the first pillar of practice, which is what we're, what we're going to get into. So let's talk about the iterations real quick. Okay, so iterations are going to be taking that same pattern and then playing multiple notes. Okay, so you got your single stroke, you got double stroke. Same thing, tag the arpeggio. Down and up, that's good. Three notes. And same thing, all the way up and down, tag your arpeggio with three notes. That's tricky because every other fret, every other note, you're gonna be switching your, your pick direction. So down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And you got four notes per fret, which kind of equals sixteenth notes. You know, when you're playing like those are sixteenth notes, and we'll talk about the meter as we're getting towards learning to count. But that's going to be one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and those are your sixteenth notes. When you so you, when you apply the sixteenth notes to the folded scale, nothing to it. Okay. And so the, then the next iteration up that I recommend is not five, but six, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 so on and so forth. You can count your downstrokes if that's easier. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. So this way you're getting some good tremolo practice in, okay? And then you can take that up to eight. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I'm, when I'm, I'm counting four, but I'm really playing an upstroke in between each of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I'm just counting the downstrokes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This is really good. This is not easy to do. But again, you're practicing that clean transition between the strings, which is really good, okay? So you have one stroke, two strokes, three strokes, four strokes, six strokes, and eight strokes with a folded scale. So that's six exercises just with the folded scale and G. You take that all up to A, do those same iterations, okay? Taking the G sharp, because once you get one close scale, like if you're doing all this stuff in G sharp, that's gonna carry into B flat, B, C, all the way up the neck. And it's the hardest in G sharp because the string spacing is the, the farthest apart, okay? So you do all that same stuff, all those different keys, tag it with an arpeggio, and you don't have to necessarily tag it with the iterations, like if you're doing your, you know. You don't have to do that. Suit yourself on that. Okay? So that's a whole bunch. Let's see how many. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, four. And then you got six. And you got eight. So that's six times three, that's 18 exercises just with that folded scale, okay? Uh, so uh, let's get Wyatt back in here and let's talk about, uh, yeah. let's talk about the skipper scale, skipper scale. This is, this has been an interesting one for me to practice. So like starting in, uh, so it's, it's similar, but not, it's not quite the same. So um, going back to your folded scale like that so i'll play the skipper scale then i'll break it apart a little bit but the skipper scale sounds like this hey what I'm just, yeah. i don't know if it's a connection but uh your notes aren't coming out i don't know if everybody else is not being able to hear the notes too you still got your uh your original sound on it might just be yeah a i do one more time please uh, Skipper scale. So why is it called skipper scale? 
Well, so you, you're skipping a note of the scale. So you know your regular scale. is just straight up and down. And then, so you're going from your G to your B, then your, your A to your C, then your B to your D. Then okay, so, so for those that, that, that confu get confused by the names of the notes, can you do it with the numbers? Yeah. Scale, scale intervals, as in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for those that don't know. Yeah, so you've got your one, three, two, four, three, five, then four, six. And this is all kind of confusing because we're not talking about yeah. the name of the frets. And so this, this can be a good reason to really try to learn it by ear. Just know that, know that, know the way it sounds. Da, 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 da. But you can pick that out like why it is saying. You start on your first note, skip the second note of your scale, go to the third note. Go back to the note you skipped, which is the second note, also the second fret. Skip over the fourth fret, back to the note you skipped, all the way. We're just going to kind of go and fast forward all the way up and down, coming back the same way. So three, open two, five, open three, five, two, three, open two, five, open four, five, two, four, open two, five, open four, five, two, four, open, and then Wyatt, you know, just kind of make the meter uh, work out good. Sometimes we'll put a little thing at the end, which you can do or not. So you take that through all the different iterations, you know. And then do your threes, sixteenth notes, which is four, so on and so forth. Not trying to be from the department of redundancy department, but you can also do sixes, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and and then eights, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And if it's confusing because I'm saying eight and counting four, I'm counting the downstrokes once again and the, the upstrokes go in between. So you do all that in G. And then a and all that in G sharp, and then you'll have, you know, I can't remember what, what we said, it'd be like, you know, 32 or 48 uh, practice exercises there if you do in all the different iterations with the three different patterns, the, the, the regular pattern, straight scale pattern, skipper pattern, and the folded pattern, so on and so forth, tagging it with an arpeggio, G, A, and G sharp. And do you really feel like it's worth doing all this stuff? Oh yeah, and you know, um, the one that I really love practicing is is the is the triplets, the the like. Uh... <laughs> that one, and because it's uh because it's dual purpose, you know, because you can get all the all that stuff out of it, and you can do like a triplet tremolo like. Okay, so you're telling me that if I practice these these scales, with it'll it'll it will um, yeah it will translate into um, almost you know any song. Okay, so when we talk about like how, uh, translating, it's you're basically practicing tremolo that way. So. directly translate like why is saying that's great okay so all of this kind of stuff is what we call grunt work or eating the the mandolin vegetables and this is going to be pillar one of the recommended practice routine yeah so if you have 30 minutes spend 10 minutes doing this kind of stuff and you might go through all of them but uh, the one that I recommend getting the most fluidity with, spin the one that helped me the most is the straight folded scale and G, A, and G sharp. And you can start with your metronome. Okay, let's talk about, let's let's, let's, head, let's a little segue into, into counting. All right. So there are different ways of counting music, like academically and counting bluegrass, you know, 
academically. <laughs> it's almost like an oxymoron. Okay, so, uh, but the way that I recommend doing it is is counting with the beat. If, if the beat's going, bow, 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 those are quarter notes. Okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Classical music might also count the, the upbeat or, or the backbeat, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, something like that. Okay, to me, I do not uh, recommend doing it that way. Just keep it simple with the beat, like where your foot taps, and that's going to be your quarter note. Okay, so the mandolin chops on the offbeat. So the guitar is doing the, the bass note and the strum. So boom, strum, boom, strum, boom, strum, boom, strum. And the way that translates is one and two and three and four and, and those are eighth notes because there are eight of them in a in a bar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the man on chops on the offbeat. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And so once again, uh, the sixteenth notes are going to be one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two. Like if you're going to play like every sixteenth every sixteenth note of a chop, one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Okay, so that's how we're going to be relating to the counting uh, in this workshop, and I think it can be a great thing to uh, to feel into if you haven't before. Can really help if you're having trouble with your phrasing understanding how like the, the bars and the beats work to give a little bit of or a lot of bit of effort in trying to to understand that okay so if you have 30 minutes spending 10 minutes on the grunt work okay and let's talk about pillar two okay so the way that like when I work with private students um, pillar two works like this so everybody in the world, most people in the world, come with a set of internal repertoire, okay? And these start with the songs that, you know, your caretaker might have sung to you when you are little. You know, little nursery rhymes, we're talking about, you know, you are my sunshine. Everybody knows that. Kind of. When I say everybody, it's very, it's a, it's sweeping generalization. Almost everybody knows "You Are My Sunshine." Okay, uh, you might know songs like, you know, in the South we had like, uh, you know, "Polly Wally Doodle." Oh, I went down south for to see my south singing "Polly Wally Doodle" all the day. All right, you might have "Skip to My Lou," Lou Lou, Skip to My Lou Lou Lou, Skip to My Lou. Almost everybody's got "Coming Around the Mountain." All right, coming around the mountain is one of the best songs ever was gave when it comes to learning how to play the mandolin, and it can parlay in a beautiful way to uh, Monroe style improvising. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. You know, you got songs like you know, will the saints be mar come marching in? What has to go? <laughs> oh, will the saints go marching in? You know that one. Yeah, everybody's pretty much got that one. Okay. Uh, you might have Amazing Grace, you know, you might have like America the Beautiful, you might have Happy Birthday, you might have, you know, so what, you, what I encourage y'all to do is with your morning coffee or your tea or your morning water, just sit down and make yourself a big list of every single song you know, okay? And Mary Had a Little Lamb, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, This Little Light of Mine, you know, these are all great teacher tunes that if you can't play them, then you basically haven't mastered beginning mandolin. Okay, and I'll say that again. It, this is the brutal truth. If you cannot really play, she'll be coming around the mountain fairly easily in G and in A. You have not mastered beginning mandolin. And so you shouldn't expect yourself to be like climbing the rungs of like intermediate mandolin adeptly, comfortably, with confidence until you can do that. You know, and you know, if you're. If you're going to want to, you know, I, I want to learn how to play rawhide and you can't play like, you know, she'll be coming around the mountain, then you're kind of putting the, cor the cart before the horse. Okay. All right. So once you got your big list of, of tunes that you know, nursery rhymes, whatever, like, I'm bringing home a baby bumblebee. Won't my mama be so proud of me? And that's Arkansas Traveler, you know. <laughs> What am I doing there? I'm speaking mandolin ease, all right? 
in like Scotland and Ireland, they kind of call that lilting. And this is really a big uh, important point. So like, what is mu? What is music? Um, different definitions of that, but the you know the root word of it is muse. And so what is the muse and you can think about it as like the thing that is entertaining about music either listening to it or playing it okay like the thing that is amusing or you can think about it uh it's not like you either or but as this thing inside you that goes that is the muse and so like when you're when you're washing your dishes and you're like i'm washing the dishes dude whistle while you work that is that's the muse and so it's our job to be able to cultivate that relationship with that thing wherever it's coming from the holy spirit the universe you know, the collective unconscious, whatever you want to call it, the goddess, uh, to strengthen that channel, to bring that out, because that is going to be the thing that powers your music. The muse is going to power your music, not, not only in terms of interpreting other people's music, but finding your own style. You know, so you want to learn to speak mandolin ease, okay? Like when you, when you, when you, you know, your friends are like, oh, you play bluegrass? And they're like, oh, it's like, oh, that's, thanks. Yeah, that's that's bluegrass, right? Uh, but in a way, they're not wrong because that's how it kind of goes. You know, so you want to be able to, to, to speak that. So on and so forth. So that's speaking mandolin ease. All right. So what you want to learn to be able to do, or what I encourage you to, to do, is be able to speak the mandolin ease of all those tunes. All right. So we're st let's let's start with like you know skip to Malou. Skip to Malou is a super super great. And I know this is going to be like you know elementary for folks that you know are are farther along on the journey, but you might find some things here that can be useful, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about counting here also, okay? So we've talked about what the quarter note is. It's where the beat is. One and two and three and four and... We talked about what eighth notes are. One and two and three and four. The quarter notes are just the ones. One, two, three, four. Eighth notes are the ands. One and two and three and four. Sixteenth notes are all of them. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. So it's one E and a. All right. So the, the E is the second sixteenth note of the quarter note. The and is the eighth note of the quarter note. And the a uh is the last sixteenth note of the quarter note. That might be complicated. Don't worry about it. But if you can just start to go one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E. Make sure you don't go five e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a so on and so forth this is a, a basic rudimentary uh foundation of counting okay let's talk about the shuffle lick the shuffle is that that's the fiddle bow that's like you know our onomatopoeia of the fiddle bow one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a and i know it can be tempting maybe to write some of this down but try not to write too much of it down just try to get the you know try to get the flow going in your mind it can be like helpful to uh, you know, kind of write some concepts down. Uh, but, oh, yeah. And again, so um, what I'm planning on doing is, uh, is well, this is recording, so I'm going to post it on, on YouTube, uh, at least for the first hour. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions in the second hour. And so there'll be some interactivity there. And so if you don't want to go on the video, then just tell me that, and then I'll take that part out. Okay. All right, so what is the shuffle lick in terms of like counting theory? Okay, so it's one eighth note and two sixteenth notes. It goes down, down, up. All right, so that's one and a. Uh. All right, so once again, that's one eighth note and two sixteenth notes. So you got down, down, up. That is your shuffle lick. Okay, so one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three. 
a lot of stuff with just the shuffle lick and eighth notes. Okay, so you can practice that. You can practice it with your straight scale. You can practice it with your skipper scale. You can practice it with your folded scale. And your shuffle lick is going to be basically your best friend for mandolin, especially beginner mandolin and intermediate mandolin. Like an advanced mandolin, you'll probably go on to more running 16th notes. But if you haven't mastered the shuffle lick, then I would encourage you to do that. Okay? So let's think about, you know, how we can count a simple song like Skip to Malou with the old shuffle lick. Okay? So key of G. Lost my partner, what will I do? Lost my partner. So here's our shuffle lick. One and a, you just play the melody. Loo, loo, skip to my loo, but with the shuffle lick. One and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and three and a four and a. So there's just that one little part at the end, which is not just a straight shuffle lick. One and a two. You have a little eighth note there. Three and a four and a. Okay, so let's take another song. Let's let's take a. Let's think about like you know she'll be coming around the mountain. All right. She'll be coming around. So if you're just gonna sing it, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. That's not how we play the mandolin. We gotta speak the mandolin ease. She'll be one and a two and a three and four and one. Okay, so when you're counting, like so, some people that are just struggling with phrasing, they might be like, they're leaving beats out, you know. So if you're learning to count, that'll keep you straight and honest with the mathematical grid. Four, and let's talk about the pickup notes. Okay, so you don't want to go one, two, three. So we're going to introduce our friend, Anna Forand. Okay, Anna Forand. All right, so many songs are going to start off with the pickup notes, Anna Forand. Anna Forand one, because you want to nail that downbeat with the number one. You want to make sure that she'll be coming. You know, you don't want to be like, she'll be coming, you know, because that'll, that'll throw your count off. So you want to start with the one on the downbeat of the first bar instead of starting with the pickup notes. That's a little bit complicated, but if you can just remember and a four and. And a four and one. Okay. And a four and one. And then from that downbeat, you can start with your uh, with your count. That'll be something like this. One and a two and a. Okay, so that's just a sh shuffle for those first two beats. One and a two and a. And then now we're going to play some eighth notes. Three and four. Okay, so it's not going to be just like shuffle the whole way. You could do it that way. One and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three. But I think it'll be most helpful if you get used to the idea that it's going to be interspersed with the shuffle lick and eighth notes. Okay, so the parts where the, the melody's moving, da, 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 da. When it's just moving like that with the words, you can just play those as long eighth notes. Well, they're, they're full-size eighth notes. They're all downstrokes. Four and... And you can start on the fourth beat, or you can start on, on the and of, of, of the third beat. So we're going to go one and two and three. And a four and one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and one and a two and a three and four. So it's going to be a challenge for uh, probably some of y'all, maybe a lot of y'all, to be able to just even count, uh, let alone match the pitch of, of the melody at the same time you're counting. But this is something that you can practice in a rudimentary way with your simple songs, okay? Saints go marching in. 
Oh, when the saints, the first thing you need to do is identify where the downbeat is. Okay. Oh, when the saints, it's not like, oh, when the saints, oh, you know, those are your pickup notes. Oh, when the saints, and guess what? They're the exact same pickup notes. And four and one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and three and four and and you'll eventually, you know, probably, hopefully, you'll start to get the flow going with, with some of this stuff, which will hopefully, you know, allow you to start to feel those four beat bars because that's the most important thing. Okay, so I can I imagine that a lot of y'all uh, are, are like, okay, you know, this is a little bit, I'm, I'm good with all that, but this is a, a wide ranging, you know, skill level workshop. So we're trying to cover all the bases and, uh, and help all the people that we can because we're going to be heading into more advanced stuff here shortly. But want to get Wyatt Ellis in here to, uh, to comment and remark on any of that with anything that he thinks is helpful. Yeah, and you know, sometimes I'll like on those simple tunes like that, I'll I'll mess around, you know. With like how much I swing it, you know. swing it like um so i can say straight like that you know you've got um so one and so that's straight and then when you add the swing in it sounds more like this So you're okay. accenting it a little bit on the one and the two. And. So it'd be like one, two, one, and two, and two, and two. And two. So yeah. like, this is a this is a little bit of a, of a tricky subject uh, yeah. when it comes to the count because what's happening with with the with the swing is that you're really turning the sixteenth notes into into triplet sub, sub subdivisions. But I think the best way for most folks to relate to it is just by that sound instead of going diggy 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 diggy. It's more like diggy 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 instead of the straight diggy 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 diggy. It's diggy diggy diggy. So it's really triple. It's triple 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 instead of one e and a two e and a three. It's really triple 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 triple. So that's that's the way I think about it. But that's a big difference between playing things straight and playing things with a swing and a swing can sound subjectively cooler. And then, you know, sometimes it goes. Great exercise there, turning the 16th notes into sextuplets. Very, yeah. very good exercise. Okay. So you got your big list of every single tune that you have ever known. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, folk songs or nursery rhymes or whatever. It can be pop tunes. It can be Beals tunes. It can be, you know, jazz tunes, um, you know, country songs, whatever, bluegrass songs. You know, you might be well knowing uh, I Saw the Light, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, uh, I'll Fly Away, um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Those are great teacher tunes. And so you learn them in G, and then you take them up to A, all right? So when, once you got, you know, and this can be frustrating. It's like, why can't I play Coming Around the Mountain in the key of A? And if you can't do that, you just want to work on it until you can. You know, so you take your... Play the exact same note path. One and a two and a three and four. And there's your 
there's your friend. So you learn to play it in G and then A and then in G sharp. Four and one and a two and a three and four and one and a two and a three and it's a little bit harder there because it is in G sharp. But you want to be able to do that. So you can do it in G sharp. You can take it up to A close position, B flat close position, B close position, C close position. Um, it's the hardest in G sharp. So if, if you do that, it's kind of like swinging with weights on your back if you want to take it up the neck. Okay. And the cool thing is that once you get it in G, you kind of get C for free. You know. Not really, because you don't have all the strings on the bottom. And, you know that you would. See so if you're in C. So you have to kind of like fudge that, the low note sometimes. So the point being that if you learn stuff in G, you kind of get C for free. And if you learn stuff in A, you kind of get D for free. All right. And the most common keys are going to be G, C, A, and D. That's how folk music works. All right, so we have now completed kind of, uh, you know, the first half of pillar two. Okay, so the second half of pillar two, and so just to reiterate, first first pillar is grunt work, scales, patterns, arpeggios, musical broccoli. Second, first half of pillar two is going to be developing your own mastery, beginning mandolin, intermediate mandolin, and advanced mandolin with your own built-in internal repertoire, which is the big list that you made with your coffee, okay? The second half of Pillar 2 is going to be picking stuff out by ear that you do not know, okay? So if you don't know Bill Cheatham, you know, and there's like the whole list of like the dozen tunes that you have to know. All right, what are the, what are the dozen tunes that you have to know, Wyatt? <laughs> like fiddle tunes or simple yeah. tunes? Yeah, or... fiddle tunes, right. Okay, fiddle tunes, you know, I think um, Bill Cheatham, Soldier's Joy, um, Arkansas Traveler. Um, you, forgot man. First, you forgot the first one. I forgot the first one. Uh, I'm just kidding. You. Old Joe Clark. Old Joe Clark, of course. Uh -huh. And then um, Red Haired Boy. Red Haired Boy. And Liberty is a good one to know. Liberty, yeah. And then there's um, Red Wing. Red Wing um, Arkansas Traveler, you know, Arkansas Salt Traveler, Red Hair Boy. You might have said that one, you know. And then you got your like Black Black Blackberry Blossom. You got Whiskey Before Breakfast. All those tunes, and there's probably you know three or four more that we didn't say. You got to know those. You got to know those. You got to know those. Um, that's just how it works. Because those are going to teach teach you like the, the little turns at the end of phrases, like you know. And, you know, you take a tune like, you know, Arkansas Traveler. That's, 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 that's the other one. Uh. What's that? That's the folded scale. So the folded scale is built right into the melody of, of Arkansas Traveler. And so you'll find that there are little pieces of the folded scale and the... And, uh, and the scales and exercises that will parlay directly into, like, you know, uh, a lot of people play Blackberry Blossom. That's the folded scale. Once again, let me get this person in here. Here comes Dan. You know, so on and so forth. Uh, so the folded scale, once again, is making a good appearance there. So if you don't know those tunes, then you can use part the second half of Pillar 2 to spend that time working on those. So you find a good arrangement that you like. There's this place called YouTube where you can find lots of different stuff, and uh, you slow it down. You listen to it. You listen to it 10 times. You get to where you can hum the melody is, is going to be really super helpful. Okay, so you listen to like you know which version do I go to. We you, you know listen to you know a few of them, see which one you like, and you start to pick it out. You know. <laughs> or maybe it's a little bit more complicated. You just slow it down. spend five minutes working on that first line. 
Okay, I think I got that. And you get that, that might take a couple minutes. Anyway, the idea is that you slow stuff down and you work on your ear picking it out so you're not glued to some piece of paper that you can't hear that you're going to be trying to memorize. But the thing that you're working on is developing your connection with the muse. Because once you can sing it, kind of, then you can kind of play it and it's not going to leave you. You know. And everybody is a little bit differently. And that's called style. You know. And so you want to be aware of like how that works with yourself and you want to trust yourself in the idea that if you feel like something's good and it sounds good then it is good if it's bringing you joy it, if it is amusing you then you are musicking in a good way okay so that is going to be first pillar of practice grunt work second pillar broken into two parts your own working on your own internal repertoire and then working on tunes that you do not know picking them out by ear and third third pillar, like with my own private students, is whatever we're working on, like in, in the session. Say we're we're working on you know Dusty Miller, Bill Monroe's version of Dusty Miller, then that would be you know working on that. So you're you're putting the good fertilizer in your garden, you know, for your technique, for your ear, and then for the relationship with with your teacher. Now, if you don't have a, a teacher, um, you know. And you're satisfied with how you're learning then great you know have at it if you're not satisfied i would really recommend you know finding the right teacher of course i teach there are a lot of great teachers out there um you know there are you know lots of dvds streaming stuff the murphy method you know, that's my folks business how to play you know bluegrass by ear um they were kind of the first uh, business in bluegrass to really commercially do by ear instruction in the early 80s started out with audio cassettes then you know vhs dvds now streaming uh but you know beginning mandolin i have you know there's, there's a slew of stuff murphymethod.com you can check that out it's great there are lots of different resources out there um you know so find the right teacher for you i would really recommend that uh but if you're just going solo you know and you're making good gains then then you know more power to you and then you can so you can split the, the the three pillars of practice into the grunt work, developing pillar one, pillar two, developing your own internal repertoire, and pillar three, picking stuff out that you want to learn, you know, by ear. Okay, all right. Why anything you want to add into that? You know, not much, but yeah, like um, Murphy Method stuff is is great. I've watched a little bit of that. Um, and I've I've played with people and say, oh, I learned that tune from the Murphy method. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it, it's great. And, you know, buy your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of uh, the Murphy method, we're uh, my my father, Red Henry, has just joined joined us here. How's it going, Padre? Whoops, I got to ask to ask to un unmute you. Hold on. I don't know if it's easy to unmute yourself on the, the phone or not. How are Everything. you? Fine here. Uh, okay. Thought I'd look on things. Excellent. We, we just spent about an hour talking about how to organize practice, and we talked about counting a little bit. Uh, is there is there anything that you'd like to? Uh, you know, I just, you know, I didn't know you were going to be joining us. Thank you for uh, for popping in here. It's nice to see you, Pop. <laughs> Way to pop. <laughs> um, so, uh, is there anything that you'd like to share with our our nice group here about you know? learning and organizing practice and or Monroe style or, or anything else bye Diane thanks well I think that counting itself is a really good skill it's it's a very valuable thing for people to keep in mind because a lot of folks just play you know they don't have any idea where they are in the scale or in the uh, beats the measure that they're in but if you're aware of those things then it really can help you figure out tunes in the first place to begin with and then play them coherently and so I think that this business about counting is good for people to learn. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that it has been uh, a big game changer with folks, especially with regard um, to uh, starting to switch and swap with the Melody and, and Monroe devices, which is about uh, where we're going to uh, be heading here. Um, so let's just uh, let's kind of jump into that a little bit. Okay. So... Uh, let's, let's start with, um, 
I thought we might start with, um, well, let's start with Blue Ridge Cabin Home, okay? So if you don't know this song, neighbors, I encourage you to, to learn it. It's uh, about the most uh, common, uh, it's kind of like the, the jam session uh, national anthem for, for bluegrass, you, you might think. Everybody in the jam sessions all over, you know, good ones anyway, uh, subjectively good ones, they're going to know the Blue Ridge Cabin Home. And so if you don't know, it's an old Flat and Scruggs song, and it can be played in a lot of different keys. We're going to look at it in the key of G, okay? Uh, so the way that the song goes, it's an easy chord progression, um, and the verse is the same as the chorus um, when it comes to the chords, all right? So the melody of the verse is slightly different than, than the chorus. And so the, the verse goes, There's a well beat path down this old mountainside Where I wandered when I was alive Just G, C, and D. Here I wandered all to a place I call home In the Blue Ridge Hills far away So it's just a bar of G. Oh, I love those hills of old Virginia C, bar D in the Blue Ridge Hills. I did bar G at the end. That's halfway through. When I die, won't you bury me on the bar C? Up to D in my Blue Ridge cabin home. Okay, so it's a bar of G. Then what is a bar? A bar is four beats. One and two and three and four. And bar C. One and two and three and four. And bar of D. One and two and three and four. And then a bar of G. One and two and so it's really uh, a great teacher tune for learning to improvise uh, because it's so simple. And it's so great. It's a great tune. It's one of the best ever. Uh, so uh, the tricky thing is uh, that the verse is what's usually played um, on the melody. So and that's where you got to start. That's the verse melody. And I wandered along to the I call home in the blue Ridge hills far away. Okay, so uh, people interpret that melody different ways. You could also just kind of play the, the, the chorus melody, which is a little bit easier. Oh, I love those hills of old Virginia. From those blue Ridge hills I did roam. When I die, won't you bury me on the mountain? Okay, so you got to have that part before you're going to have a chance at improvising well. And the tricky part about the improvising is that, you know, at its best, you don't want the, the devices or the licks to do anything but complement the melody. You know, because, you know, basically you can never play anything in a way better than... melody spot on. That's a kind of an advanced way to play the melody with double stops and all that little bounces, you know, here and there. But that's right on the melody. But we're going to be looking at uh, our friends, the modular devices of Bill Monroe, as codified in the Monroe Style Improvising uh, workshop series and courses. Oh, I also want to say that if any of y'all want to get any of the courses, I will give you a 50% discount. And you can find all that on NoyaMountainMusic.com. There are 12-week courses and there are eight of them. Uh, a lot of your f favorite uh, Bill Monroe tunes, uh, in the, which are built off the workshops that we do uh, with David McLaughlin, why it's been in about 95 of them. I think we've done 95 at this point. Okay, so uh, that's where you got to start. You got to start with the melody to be able to, to speak the mandolin ease. <laughs> So you got to have some version of that that you can play. That's your foundation for being able to do anything else. Okay. So right now we are going to introduce uh, the first uh, device. Okay. And it's going to be called the slidey lick. And so this is going to be getting complicated quickly. 
All right, so the slidey lick is a four beat lick that sounds like this. Okay, so it's 15 16th notes. Well, it's really 14 16th notes and one eighth note. All right, it starts, excuse me, it starts on the downbeat. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Okay, so this is our slidey lick. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. I'm gonna um, show this to you in detail. Okay, it's gonna have the first half. One E and a two E and. All right, so with your ring finger, you're pulling down from the fifth fret to the third fret. Those are your first three sixteenth notes. One E and. This is all gonna be continuous down and up picking. And so you're not going to repeat any strokes down or up. So we got one E and five, four, three. And you're, and you're going to continue with an upstroke on the first fret. Slide that into the second fret. Also pick it. So those are your first five notes. One E and a two. All right. So five, four, three, one, two. Down, up, down, up, down. Okay. Now we're going to cross over to the fifth fret of the D with an upstroke and then hit a downstroke. All right, that's your first half. One E and a two E and. All right, so we're going to be moving pretty quickly, but just try to get that. One E and a two E and. That's your first half of the slidey lick. The second half sounds like this. Okay, so the second half continues in the sequence of pick strokes down and up with an up stroke. It's going to be the first fret of the A, slide into the second fret, up to the fifth fret of the A, then the third fret. So let's just get that part. One, two, five, three. That's going to start with an up stroke, remember. Up, down, up, down. One, two, five, three. And then the last three notes, continuing with an up stroke on the first fret. One, two, and then that was really four notes. Then you're gonna have uh, an upstroke, then a downstroke on the fifth fret of the D. All right, so the back half, one, two, five, three, one, two, five, five. The last two fives are on the D string. Okay, so that's the back half. Do, 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 do. It's best if you can hear that. La, di, da, da, di, 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 di. Okay, so the first half. Da, 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 di, 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 ba, da, the whole thing. First half, one E and a two E and. Second half, a three E and a four E and. All right, so that is our slidey lick. All right, it ends with an eighth note on the and a four. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Okay, so this is a wonderful lick that you can play through this entire break just to get to know it. Okay. In the blue hills far away tag lick at the very end. But this is where you can get to know this great lick very well. Okay, so what happened? You know, start on the fifth fret of the A for G. And you start your C slidey lick on that same note, fifth fret of the D. So that's how you play the slidey lick in, in C. You just come on down to the fatter strings and start on the fifth fret of the D. For D, you got two options. You can move up and you can start with your ring finger on the seventh fret of the D. That works perfectly fine. It's even easier to start on the fifth fret of the E. Okay, so that's how the slidey lick works in the one, four, five, G, C, and D. Okay, for G, start on the fifth fret of the A. For C, start on the fifth fret of the D. For D, start on the fifth fret of the E. And then you finish out that um, line uh, on, with G again. And you start over in G. Okay. So now we have one device. I know that that's you know take you know a long time to just even even get that much, but we're going to be moving faster for the folks that are more advanced. Okay. So now we have the task of starting to uh, blend the device with the melody. 
okay? So this one, you gotta know the melody, and you gotta know what the melody sounds like when you get to the, to the C chord. Well, there's a well beaten path down this. And then, so when you go into the C chord, you know, you can play it different ways. Old mountainside, where I... That could be one way to play it. Or you can go, old mountainside, where I... Let's just assume that we're going to start on the A note. Old mountainside, where I... This is your C bar, all right? So start on the one and a two and three and a four and... So if you play your G slotty lick, it's going to be like this, into the melody for C. Just keep playing your melody. You can have pickup notes into the slotty lick. Little and four and. So after you come out of your D, one and a two and three and a four and one e and a two e and a three and a four and one e and. You can do it different ways. You know, just kind of follow your ear there. Uh, but you're probably going to be cueing it with the, the pickup notes and a four and one and back into your slotty leg okay so that's one way that you can start to get to know the slotty leg you put it for the first four beats the first bar of the G and then go into your melody stay in your melody for the for the rest of that line you know Let's try a different way. Okay, let's try starting out with the melody in G and then going to the device over the C chord. All right, so there's a well beaten path down this old mountainside where I wander. So now we're just putting it on the C chord. So now we put it over the C chord. Let's see if we can just put it over the D chord. All right, so you got melody over the G chord, melody over the C chord, and then the slidey over the D lick, all right? see there that it worked a little bit better to play that slotty lick out of the D chord position rather than start on the fifth fret of the E, just in terms of continuity with the melody, because when you're in the C playing the melody, that line right there, the pickup notes to the D bar, walk right up to that fifth in D, which is the seventh fret of the D. Instead of going from the C, so there's that weird, you know, octave jump there. So these are the things that you encounter when you're working with the this this system of, of improvising. Okay. So now we've tried that one lick over the, the the G bar, the C bar, and the D bar in in the different places. Okay. So now you can try. Well, let me try on the first two chords and then go into the melody for the for the D chord. All right. Blue, get these people in here. Blue ridge hills far away. Two, So now you can see at the end of that one. All right, so now we're starting to modulate these, these devices because you can modulate them to reflect the continuity of the melody, and that's the, the best way to do it. So instead of just going, we're putting a little bit of a, 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 a scalar line to connect the melody to the lick. So when we're doing the slidey lick the regular way, we just end with an eighth note on the fifth fret of the A. But in this case, we're going to play that last downstroke on the third fret of the A and then play an upstroke on the second fret of the A. And then from there you can do a little tag lick. Or whatever. 
of your life. Okay, so now uh, we have this concept of, of what's happening. So you have one lick and you're trying to all the different places trying to get back to the melody. Okay, let's Wyatt, you want to chime in here for a second? Uh, you, you went sure, dark. yeah. Dark. Why don't you talk about this for just a second, and I'll be right back. Hold court. Okay, yeah. I just dropped my pick. <laughs> Where'd it go? Under here. Well, dang it. Here, let me get this pick. <laughs> ah. I don't know what happened to Wyatt. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, hope you enjoyed the nice little break to uh, to work on the slidey lick. Okay, we're gonna look look at our our second. I'm sure what he was gonna say was gonna be great. He'll, he'll come back. He always does. All right, so now we're gonna look at uh, our second. Here comes Wyatt. <laughs> Let's see where is he? Got a lot of people here. Got Australia. Hey, Diane. There he is. He come back. I dropped my pick and then my computer fell and then it got shut. Oh, when it rains, of course. And then I'm back here now. Well, yeah, so, yeah, you were talking about the. <laughs> the slidey lick. I love that one. And you know, uh -huh. you hear Bill use it in so many variations, and like in John Henry. Lick like that, uh, like yeah. different songs like that. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, anything you want to add onto that that might be helpful for people? And you know, like um, there's a, a lot of other ways to do like slidey things, like like. Use yeah. it not just the same lick, but you could slide anything, you know. Uh, yeah. So in in uh in like classical music, they call the slide the glissando. Uh, yeah. Maybe may, may be aware of, and so when you get to you know, if you get if you like that sound, you know, it can really be expansive. Mike Compton doing his slideys all the time, which is a great sound. Um, that's obviously very advanced, but you can uh, you, you can explore that kind of stuff. The slidey arpeggios are kind of like the you know, and that's through the infinity shape. Uh, so yeah, good point. You can uh, you can really take the slideys and and go to the, to the moon and back with them. Let's look at our next uh, Monroe modular device which is going to be the staggered 16th notes yay staggered 16th notes Woo this is a party um staggered, uh, that's not the party where's the party there's the party that's good okay so staggered 16th let's go like this So that's a good sound, right? 
Um, well, hopefully, hopefully they think it is. Uh, this is a classic Monroe sound and texture that kind of gives you two notes for free. Uh, it's a little bit challenging to get get the hang of it, um, but once you do, it's uh, it's one of the most powerful devices you can use for improvising uh, and interpreting bluegrass music, folk music, any kind of music. Well, maybe not any kind of music, but a lot, a lot of good kinds of music. All right, so we're using the staggered technique over the arpeggio. <laughs> And once again, we're doing that the the fourteen sixteenth notes and one eighth note. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. Okay, so what's happening here is we're moving through the arpeggio. So you got another arpeggio, and what happens with the stagger technique is you start with the downstroke and you move through the line. In this case, the, the major arpeggio with an upstroke first, then a downstroke on each new note. Okay, so I'm going to say this three times more. You start with a downstroke, and you move to the next note with an upstroke first, then a downstroke. Then you move to your next note with an upstroke, then a downstroke. Then you move to your next note with an upstroke, then a downstroke. Then you move to your next note with an upstroke, then a downstroke, and so on and so forth all the way. Okay, so it can be a little bit counterintuitive because we're used to like going to our next note on a downstroke. Okay, but that's not the way this works. That's why it's cool. All right, so you're starting with a down, and then every new note is going to start with an up, then a down. So down, up, 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 down. And as you can see, once we've got to the top of the arpeggio, we came back down to the fifth fret of the A, which is the next arpe arpeggio note down, and that's where we're going to end. So one E and a two E and a three. That's going to be our staggered bar, four beats of arpeggio in G. And that's what we're going to use as our main device here. Okay. And now it's really good uh, to learn how to do that in, uh, in all the different keys. Okay. So when we're thinking about C, how do we do it in C? The way that's most similar to G is starting uh, on the fifth fret of the G. because the pattern is basically the same. If you start down here out of your C chord, you're going to have to do it like this. Which is a lot harder. You can finger with either your little finger on the 7th fret of the A or your ring finger on the 7th fret of the A. So there's two different ways to do it. I know this is going to be really challenging for uh, for some folks, but we're just you know, we're kind of heading down the road here. Uh, so that's ascending through the two octave major arpeggio in G and C. And you can do the same thing in D. Starting on the seventh fret of the G, or you can do it out of the chord. Like It's just the same thing as C, except moved up two frets. All right, so that's ascending. And you can also do it descending. All right, and that was from the major third up high, 7th fret of the E, you can also do it from the, the 1, which is 3rd fret of the E. This is where the counting can come in helpful, because you want to count until the AND of 4. 1 E AND A 2 E AND A 3 E AND A 4 E AND. Alright, so if you're, that's, you know, descending, if you're going to ascending, 1 E AND A 2 E AND A 3 E AND A 4 E AND. Okay, so now let's put this into play. Alright, so if you want to use the staggered arpeggio in G and then go to your slidey lick, all right, and then go into the melody. We're still on Blue Ridge Cabin Home. It's going to sound like this. Okay, so this is like stuff that's going to take a long time to integrate if you're just learning it here today. Um, but you can refer to this video uh, to go back and, and learn the notes, all that kind of stuff. We're just cruising, you know, so pick up what you can. And we are going to open it up for, for questions here shortly. Um, but just want to, once again, remind you that you can use all this stuff in any kind of way, mix and match. This is where the creativity begins. This is where your style starts to develop, okay? So, you know, you can put the arpeggio. Let's just kind of run it through real quick. So let's say melody G, staggered arpeggio in C, melody in D. All right. 
Let's do the let's do the staggered arpeggio over the D. Okay, so now we're mixing and matching. We're switching and swapping a little bit. So with these very with these three variables, the melody, the slidey lick, and the and the staggered arpeggios. How's that work? It would, would it be three to the third power? Would that be nine different ways you can do it? With, if there's four chords, uh, I'm just, I'm, I should stop talking right now. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Okay, it gets exponentially creative there. Okay, Wyatt, you want to chime in here? Yeah, and like. Um... <laughs> like using those big staggered things you can uh same with the slidey like like i said you got you got the simple version and then you got more like uh, um, a little more complicated versions but when you go to um it's the same thing with um the staggered stuff uh i chris started out with the uh, You got the starting on the third. Uh, That's what we call the infinity pattern there. Yeah. That's a great way to get to know the the, the middle and upper registers of the mandolin, and then you, then you know, the then you're third. one fret away from your C arpeggio, which uh, you can get the. Uh, then you can. Go to D or like that. Yeah. So what's what what Wyatt is demonstrating is one of the 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 most advanced ways that you can use these techniques. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which is which is you know, which is a, a fun goal to reach for. for sure. Now, so uh, just really quickly, uh, let's talk about the bounce lick. The bounce lick goes like this. So it's a scale, and this is gonna we're gonna we're gonna be using it as a D lick. So this is our, our five chord lick. All right. So it's a cool sounding lick. It sounds noty, but it's really not too bad. All right. So what it is is a scale from the fifth fret of the E all the way down to the fifth fret of the D. And you're gonna be using your little finger twice. Once on the the seventh fret of the A once on the seventh fret of the D. All right. All right. So five, three, two on the E. Then you switch to your seventh fret of the A. Seven, five, three, two. And then switch to your D string. Seven, five. So it's a scale from the fifth fret of the E to the fifth fret of the D. And then you just bounce off each note to the open note. Nothing to it. Bouncing. Sometimes you can put a couple little pickup notes onto it. And then from there, once you get the fifth fret of the D, that's that's where your G bar starts. Okay, so this is one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one and two and three. Ba -dum -ba. Then you're halfway through there. Okay, so if we're going to put it in play. So now, if now we got our three friends. We got us we got our slotty lick, we got staggered arpeggio, we got the bouncy lick. Now with these three licks, you can play a ton of bluegrass without even knowing the melody, as long as you know the chord progression. Okay, so let's think about starting with the staggers, go to the slidey lick and C, and then play your bounce.
Click in D. All right. In the blue ridge hills far away. That's the game right there, all right? And the cool thing is that you can just take all this stuff up to A or wherever, you know. Okay, so really quickly, uh, let's just think about like, you know, will the circle be unbroken? And will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? You got another melody. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky. Same kind of idea. So you, you think about your road map. So like, there's a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. So you got two bars of G. All right. So you think, what can I do? Okay, right off the bat, you think, I can play the melody. Number two, how many slidey licks can I play? Number three, how many, you know, stagger 16th notes can I play? Can I play the melody and then go into my slidey lick? Man with the circle be unborn. That would work, and this is all kind of like flavor to taste. You know, that's where you start to modulate the devices, you know, to reflect the melody a little bit more. Okay, so can I start with the uh, uh, staggered arpeggios and then go into melody? Will the circle be unbroken by and by? It takes a little bit of, you know, finesse and practice and all that kind of stuff. But you get the idea. So you have these licks, you know, by and by, Lord, by and by. You always want to kind of come out of the device right back into the melody. So that means you got to really know the melody and what you're doing when you go to the next chord change. Okay, so I know this is probably going to be going over a lot of people's heads, but hopefully it's going to be, you know, connecting with, with some of y'all. And uh, and I encourage y'all to to work on all this kind of stuff. You know, work on it with your coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. You know, we will all rush out to meet her when she comes. She will all rush out to meet her when she comes. She will, you, know, you can get the picture, okay? So, well, once again. So you have three bars of G there. So you can fit a bunch of stuff in there. You know, you can start out with melody. <laughs> kind of mix and match and flavor to taste. But this is an intro to Monroe style improvising, and I hope that it's it's connecting with, with a lot of y'all. And uh, I know Wyatt's got a uh, he's got a slide here kind of early, so uh, I want to turn it over to him, and then we'll open it up for questions. All right, Wyatt, anything you want to add on to any of that? Yeah, you know, like uh, something that uh, you just call like the lick is uh, uh, the is out of. Uh, I heard Bill play in the um, bluegrass breakdown on the on the B part where where it's usually. That part. Why is your original sound on still? Yeah. Maybe click it off. Click it back on. I will. Yeah. There it goes. Okay, so like um, that that lick with the bouncy lick that he plays sometimes in the B part is. So. Like that. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that would be a, a, a bounce lick leading from the one to the four chord. We were looking at leading from the five to the one chord. But yeah, that's another whole like um, modular device. We talked about the, the lick. We even did that in White House Blues also. So you can see you can take it from, from G right up to A, right up to B. That's, that's one of the more advanced modules, but that's an excellent one. And thanks for uh, thanks for thinking about that. So, how much time you got, buddy? Ten minutes. Yeah, ten. Cool. Ten minutes. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, if you want to, you know, you can either do the like raise your hand thing in the reactions, or just actually raise your hand and uh, you know, and hopefully I'll be able to to see you. If there's anything that you want to talk about, this kind of stuff, other stuff, you know, whatever. Now is the time. For the questions, is that Gina? Let me try to get you unmuted here. Nice can to see you. Gina. How are you? Great, thanks, Chris. Yeah. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know you could probably take a whole two hours on what I'm about to ask you, but uh, just your thoughts uh, on a on tremolo. Uh huh. Um, one of the ways that I'm starting to get a little better at it, I'm finding, has a lot to do with the attack of the pick mm -hmm. and not getting caught, you know, and angling huh. it a little more 45 degrees. And so okay. it slides off the string. Uh -huh. What do you, how do you feel about that school of thought of using a rest stroke to kind of getting you started into a tremolo? There's a, you know, that's a certain technique of doing it that I've found is working for me a lot better, but what's okay. what, you know, you want to talk a little bit about the physical part of it. Cause that's the one part where, um, you know, video lessons and books like that never seems to really get it you know I, it, it's almost like somebody has to show you or you have to see them and they you know it's like a yeah. real physical thing okay so based on what you just shared there i think that if you found a way into it that is giving you good results then then do that i think everybody's a little bit different you know physiology can be different all that kind of stuff to me uh the the tremolo has a lot to do with um you know for me uh just uh kind of brute force um and just kind of willing it to happen you know definitely for for bill monroe style mandolin that was that's a factor like this like hoss kind of intent that i'm going to play this tremolo and i'm going to force it to happen and whatever like power i need to generate in my hand wrist thumb arm spirit body fire whatever um is going to happen uh you know to 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 a point um, different kind of tr tremolos, you know, everybody likes a little something different. Dave McLaughlin has a beautiful, like, you know, very precise mathematical tremolo. Bill's tremolo was a little bit more, like, kind of feel-oriented here and there. He it wasn't as quite, you know, as, as mathematically precise. Um, so that's kind of a, a flavor-to-taste kind of thing. But with regard, let, let me just uh, clarify in my mind that you're asking uh, thoughts on what can help develop tremolo as far as right hand technique yeah i would say that uh you know honestly uh running running the the, the scale exercises with the with the you know with the tremolo in mind so just depending on what kind of tremolo you're going for if you're going for the 16th note tremolo you know. So you might even think about like, okay, so let's use an example. What is an example of uh, a song that you're working on tremolo for? Something like Lonesome Moonlight Waltz would be a good example. Okay, cool. So, so perfect. So this is, uh, this is what I call the really big old chickadee uh, tremolo. Okay. Really big old chickadee. Really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee. To me, this is the, the, the quintessential uh, tremolo for three-quarter time. Uh, Lonesome Moonlight Waltz is in D, D minor, so you can try the really big old chickadee. I saw, uh, remember, you start the you start on the really big old chickadee, or you can start on the I saw. Uh. All right, so when you think about, like, the scale, really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee. 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 I saw a. Okay, so it's really big old chickadee. Really big old chickadee. I saw a 
really big old chickadee. I saw a really big old chickadee. I saw a really big old chickadee. And then just practicing that with a metronome. And that's one thing I didn't talk about with the whole practice thing is start with a you know start with a metronome. Start slow and work on your on your on your scales and make sure you can play them perfectly cleanly all the way up and then to crank that metronome up a little bit maybe one beat per minute two beats per minute a day you know in a month you might be able to get 30 the, the low-hanging fruit you know it's going to come quicker after a while it might take you know more days to get a single beat anyway so uh, this is the tremolo uh, for lonesome moonlight waltz you know All the way through. Really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee, I saw a really big old chickadee, I saw. So practice that scale. And so w with my right hand, with my whole like what I, what I'm doing is I'm going for the sound in my in my head I'm connecting with my muse and it, and it's telling me digga 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 ding 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 digga 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 ding 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 really big chicka dee I, I don't hear the really big chicka dee in my head I, I hear the digga 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 ding which is the sound of the mandolin digga 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 dee ding ding 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 and so the the force and a lot of it's coming from you know the thumb and, and the wrist. You know, I'm thinking with my with my thumb. You know, those one, two, three, four, the four downstrokes. I'm getting the upstrokes in the middle. One, two, three, four. 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 So that's the way that I relate to it. This is the same great tremolo that you can use for anything in recorded time, practically speaking, you know, you know. Amazing grace, how sweet the really big old chickadee. I saw a really big old chickadee. 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 Same thing, you know, for for three quarter time. So I don't know if that's helping or not, but that's the way I relate to it. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so practicing your scales, you know, and just like just you, know, you got. You, you, you got to hoss into it. If you feel like there's energy lacking, then you got to connect with that fire energy, you know, which can be, you know, which can be a strength or a weakness. Like some people might, might say that I have a little too much fire, you know, maybe I, may I, maybe I need a little bit more water or earth to ground, you know, everybody's got their strengths and in, in, in all that. Why anything you want to add in there? Thanks for the question, Gina. Man, I think you covered it really good. You know, that was, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I don't that. think so. Okay, cool. Any yeah. other questions? Well, I, I don't want to uh, keep you past the time that you need to go, Wyatt. So, um, yeah. I, I hear somebody talking. I don't know who it is. Is it someone who's saying something? No. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, it's, I think it's John. All right. Uh, so yeah, Wyatt. Uh, if there's anything else, what, what, you, you have a few few more minutes, or you got to go. Yeah, I think I'll be fine all the way up until you know three. Okay. Actually, right, cool. good deal. Good deal. All right. So uh, more questions, please. Just you know, feel free to raise a hand, <laughs> and if I see ya, then yeah. See, so we'll go to Tate. How you doing, Tate? Just got to get you unmuted, buddy. There we go. Hey, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, this is this has been great. Yeah, so S simple. Oh, if you took a simple, your key. How do you know to move the next key? Do you just okay? So, I know it could get complex. Yeah, so you're you're breaking up a, a lot. What what I'm hearing is how do you know if you take a simple melody? How do you know when to move to the next key? I don't know. Like, what key it's in uh -huh. another key uh 
Maybe say it one more time a little slower, so, so, uh, more slowly. The connection is not so good. Sorry. Um, how, how to change keys on a simple melody? How to change keys? Like, so if you're taking, like, coming around the mountain, how do you do that in A? Yes. How do you, is there a simple way to do that? Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Great question. Very important question. Okay. Uh, first answer is follow your ear. All right. So if you're in G and you're in, and that's the whole thing. Like you got to start your G chord and you got to figure out where to start. She'll be coming down the mountain. It's like, how do you do that? Um, some people will, will be able to hear that. And some people will, will really need to be told like where to start. Okay. So in this case, uh, let's just, let's take, take the two examples to say, okay, I can hear it. Now she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. So if you're going to A, you just strum your A chord. Now she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. That's identifying based on your connection with your internal muse what the starting, where the melody is. And then from there, you're just picking it out. So you're like, she'll be coming. So you find that first note. Nope, no. Where is it? No, 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 no. Oh, there it is. Got your first note. You know, she'll be, she'll be, she'll be, she'll be, she'll be, she'll be. There it is. There's, there. She'll be. Got two notes. Coming. Oh, I got the third one for free. Yeah. She'll be coming around the mountain. Because that's doing it based on the muse. If that's not, if that's not easy, then you kind of have to calculate it a little bit. And so it's like, okay, so I'm in G. I know how to play it in G. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. I know that the melody starts on the one note, which is the fifth fret of the D, which is the G note. I know my pickup notes are going to be the open D, second fret of the D, up into the fifth fret of, of the D. Okay, so if you have that much, then you can kind of do your little calculation to take it up to, to A, you know, which is which is easy. You just think about what your first note is, and you just move it up two frets. So if your first note in, in G is open D, then your second and then your first note in A is going to be up two frets because A is just two, two frets chromatically. Um, and then from there, it's just kind of the same. You know, if, if you know, you you know, you might be getting it from here. Your second note is going to be the two frets up from the second fret of the D. Your, um, your, your downbeat is going to be two frets up from the D, uh, fifth fret of the D in, in A. Is that helping at all? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, a very, very good question. Um, I would encourage everyone to work as much as, as you can on developing the connection, like the, the muse kind of internal connection. So you can just go like, okay, I'm going to be in the key of E flat. So you just kind of strum that chord out a little bit and try to find she'll be coming down the mountain. So try that and then hack that out. Where's that coming? To me, hacking is the real key to all of this stuff because that's how you, you know, teach yourself, you know, the mechanics. That's how you teach yourself the relationship between what's coming out of the mandolin and your internal muse. All that kind of stuff is hacking, hacking, hacking all the way. Um, you know, we do all these videos in, in the Monroe style improvising, which is what I call a hacking teaching video, which is where we'll put the original recording on. We'll go through it slowly. We'll listen and then you'll watch me like uh you know with various degrees of success try to figure out what bill is doing and and you know hear mistakes hear stuff wrong get stuff right get excited about it because it's really an exciting thing when you can you know pick out some stuff and and you know get it underneath your your fingers i see your, your hand up there john i'll get to you in just a second um so yeah th those are my my thoughts on on how to do that anything you want to add there wyatt man if you don't quit covering these so well I'm not going to have anything to say. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Daddy, anything you want to add about how to uh, change keys? Changing keys? Uh -huh. Well, to me, the essential thing was always just to play. Mm -hmm. To play and play and play. Uh, play a tune in one key. Play a tune in another key. Pick it out. Pick it out. Your fingers, after a while... We'll learn where the notes are. And I never found anything magic about it, except just to get some experience with the mandolin and hack at it until it sounded right. Yeah. You know, uh, Dave McLaughlin uh, told about a very useful practice thing he used to do, uh, especially back when he was playing classical mandolin, and that is to play a tune in all the different keys. You can do that with Turkey in the Straw. Your brain will know when you're playing the right notes. Play Turkey in the Straw in G. 
G sharp, A, B flat, B, all the way up. And that's a good example of how to figure out how to change keys because your brain will tell you, your ears will tell you when you got the wrong note. And if it sounds wrong, it's wrong. If it sounds right, it is right. I think you hit the nail on the head. Thank you very much for that. Why would you like to demonstrate that? Turkey in the straw and going around the horn. Oh, all the way around. Okay, yeah. yeah. Let me get my minute. Now. I used to watch Red and David do this, and so I, I encourage Wyatt to learn how to do it. Yeah, uh, like starting in G. <laughs> Question yeah, about that. Like, uh... It's interesting because you know I was trying to. You, there's many ways to play it, but if you just, I was trying to stick to the the high, playing it high. Then. Yeah it up for each time we had a question from zach about this when he says when you try to go around the horn like that with the fiddle tune do you try to stay in open position as much as possible or close position? i mean a lot of times i will move but you know like if i'm like in this key like uh a flat it's super hard you know just uh, playing an open well you can't really you know, and, but, you know, if I'll move to A. You know, I'll play in an open position then, you know, and then like maybe C. You know, you can't, you can't get off the low notes. There. So to me, what I take from that is what also what I do, is, and maybe I'm not getting this right, maybe I am, uh, but you just kind of do what's easy. Yeah. And th that's to me like that there's a, an interesting connection between what is easy and what uh, the tradition is, because there's this whole thing about like Occam's razor, like uh, what whatever the easiest answer is, is the most correct one. Um, so I think there is something to that, uh, but there's also something to like being. Yeah, able like. To um... Cause like when you're in C, I don't like playing it down there, you know. So maybe I like. Or maybe. Then move down or something like that. Just whatever is easy. Very well done. Very well done. John John has had his hand up here for a little while. Let's get to John, and then we'll have one more question, and then we'll head towards closing out. Thank you very much, Wyatt. Yeah. So, John, we got to get you unmuted. If you know how to do that, we just want to get you unmuted so we can hear you, partner. So uh, we, we can see about that. Um, so he'll work on that and while, while he's figuring that out. 
Uh, yeah, very welcome, Doug, and uh, and thanks for the kindness, Mike. Uh, John, we're just trying to wait and wait on you to, to get that uh, to get you unmuted so we can hear what your question is. Um, there was a question from uh, Jean. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm saying That's that right. Jeannie. Yeah, Jeannie, thank you. Uh, the infinity device. Okay, yeah. So the infinity device is uh, is a, is a, a pattern uh, on on the mandolin fretboard that will get you from a low third to the high fifth. So what? It, and it's also a sound. So this is like a lot like this, except it's starting on a different note. Okay, so what this is, is starting with your first finger on the fourth fret of the G. The key to it is getting your middle finger next. The next middle finger goes on the seventh fret of the G. And then you're up to the fifth fret of the D with your first finger. All right, those are your first three notes. Fourth fret of the G, middle finger on the seventh fret of the G, over to the D string, fifth fret with your first finger. All right, then your ring finger hops up to the ninth fret of the D. Then you're over to the A string, fifth fret of the A. So from here we got four, seven on the G, five, nine on the D, and then five, and then we got the 10th fret on the A, and you can either do that with your little finger or your ring finger, let's use the little finger for now. So little finger on the 10th fret of the A, seventh fret of the E with your middle finger, and then your little finger again on the 10th fret of the E. That's the whole thing. And it works nicely staggered. Down, up, 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 down, down, up, 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 down, down. Okay, so starting on that major third, you can also start it from the open G. That's staggered to me. One of the best places that you can learn to apply this is in Salt Creek. So the B part in Salt Creek goes down, 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 That's A, and it goes to G, back to A, and your ending lick. So you have a full bar of A, two, three, and the full bar G, one, two, three, four, full bar A, two, three, and the split bar A, A, E, A. And so you can use the, the infinity pattern with the stagger technique to go through the full A bar. That's starting on the sixth fret of the G for A, and then go to the fourth fret of a to start your or fourth, fourth fret of the G to be in, in G for your full bar of G. I know this is going kind of quickly. And then back to A. Then you start your downbeat of the ending leg. So the whole thing ends up being. And you can reverse that. Descend, ascend, and descend. Up, down. Ending lick. And reverse that. Up, down, up. So that is uh, kind of one of the best ways to get into uh, practicing the infinity shape. You can practice it, you know, single stroke. And then it's nice to, to pair with your other arpeggios off the neck. That's single stroke, and then you can do the double the the, the um, stagger technique. And so the cool thing about this is that it's kind of always underneath your fingers, or at least parts of it are. Anytime you're in like a two finger shape, you can always break out into the infinity. So if you're in C, you won't get as much of it, but you know, if you're in F, E, G, you know, A, C, getting up there into the hawk's nest there. Um, so it's always kind of like right underneath your fingers. Anytime you have a chord going, you might have a less or more of the shape depending on where you are. If you're starting on the G, G string from E, a to B flat to B to C, then you have the full thing. You know, up and down. So I hope that is uh, 
a decent primer in what's going on. It's a lot of information, but uh, you know. all this stuff is covered in detail in the in the full Monroe style improvising courses. And if anybody wants to take private lessons, you know, we can arrange for that. All that is great, great, great. So we're about at uh, at uh, at four o'clock. John, uh, what was your question, buddy? No, oh, there we go. Hey, how do you hold a pet? How, how do you hold your pet when you try to do the tremolo? How do I hold my, my pick when I try to do tremolo? Uh, basically, I don't have any different technique between how I, I just play. You know, okay. So what is tremolo? You know, according to Butch Bottle. Uh, the classical like definition of tremolo is just basically anytime your your pick is in constant motion. So people have a lot of different pick holds, um, but I kind of and people talk about Monroe style, you know, being the bone on bone kind of thing, like with the knuckle of your thumb and like the knuckle of your first finger, and that's kind of like you know. <laughs> get a lot of power and volume and, and all that kind of stuff not 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 super great for net for finesse in, in a way if you're doing the bone on bone kind of thing the knuckle on knuckle thing i usually don't do that so i just kind of take my pick and like you know put it just a little bit out there kind of as an extension of my like the last part of whatever that is called of your finger that last, last little section there and then uh, you know, I, I usually tell people to have it kind of straight out like that, like it's just like kind of like your finger. But what what I found is that usually I'm a little bit more like that. So it's not like a direct extension. It's more like out that a, a little bit and just a little bit, not a lot of pick, not a lot of pick, just a little bit of pick. Um, so that's that's how I hold the pick right there. Um, my my thumb is like you know, yeah. right into that corner there. And then just a little bit to the side. That's how I hold my pick. And I usually, you know, have usually kind of have my fingers all, all together like that. That is what's going on there. It's not the, the easiest to see, but that's that's what I do. Yeah. Why? What do you do? I do basically the same thing. And I'm and I'm gonna say real quick that um, I'm gonna have to run, but this has okay. been great. And thanks everybody for coming. Yay, thank you so much, Wyatt. This is a yeah. community to be able to share uh, the time and, and the music. And I hope all of your uh, recording goes good in Nashville. Tell everybody so we said hi, and we'll see you before long, I guess maybe on Monday. Yeah, that'd be great. Come to the workshops if you get a chance. They're great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would invite everyone to uh, come to the Monroe and Beyond workshop. The last one we're going to have is like the 29th of December. And then we're gonna start a whole new uh, workshop series, which is gonna be Monroe style jamming. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, appreciate everyone being here. Red, would you like to share any last words of wisdom to all the the budding Monroe style players and pickers? Well, I would like to say that it's great to see this much participation, to see all these good learners tuning in and and enjoying the lessons. And the best thing I can say to anybody who wants to learn to play a mandolin is pick play that just listen and play listen and play and you will learn to play mandolin uh, excellent excellent yeah that, that's the ticket anything that's going to keep that mandolin in your hands is uh is great and let's see yeah so yeah um there's going to be a, a discount for for noia mountain music which is going to be 50 percent off any of the big courses which are fairly expensive they're 12-week courses I think they're uh, two hundred fifty dollars. So anybody that wants uh, one of those big long courses, which is like, you know, it's a, a mountain of information that can take years to to integrate. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun to go through it. Uh, some of them feature Red, and uh, all of them feature David and uh, Mike Compton's in there, Lauren Price, Richard Brown, all kinds of like you know great people. I think Ronnie McCurry's in the very first one. So if you want if you want to do that, then just uh, you know, um, and thank you for that, Zach. Appreciate that very much. Uh, you know, I'm easy to get a hold of. I'll put my email in the uh, in the chat right here. Christopher at Noia Mountain Music. You know, I'm easy to get a hold of through. Uh, whoops, I was going to Mike Burks and he's not even here. Uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. You know, through through Facebook or just go to the website noiamountainmusic.com. And uh, I'm happy to be happy to fix that up directly. You just need to send me a, a message, and then uh, and then we'll work that out. 
Um, but yeah, it's been been a lot of fun to uh, to share this with y'all. I know that it was probably it's interesting trying to you know do a workshop with all different ranges of abilities. But hopefully everyone's coming out of it with a little something. Um, you know, whether it's like, you know, organizing the practice or the slotty lick or learning to count a little bit or just a little bit of, of inspiration, you know, here or there or thinking about like making that big list of, you know, of all the tunes, you know, from the nursery rhymes to all, all the way through it and just like, you know, learning to play that stuff in G and in A uh, and to master the beginning mandolin is going to make, you know, intermediate mandolin and Monroe style a lot easier. So yeah, please give me a holler whenever I can help y'all. And, uh, and thanks daddy for joining us. Really appreciate that. Good to see you. Looking forward to seeing you, uh, on Monday night. It's Red's birthday on Tuesday. So I'm going up for, uh, to see him in, in Virginia there and, uh, Thanksgiving and all that. I hope you'll have a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll say that's, that's two weeks from now. Yeah. The 22nd. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, let's just uh, let's all stick together and just give me a holler whenever I can help. And lots of love from Charlotte. Adios, neighbors.